Hello, and welcome to GinOps for Multi-Cloud Applications. My name is William Chia. I'm part of the product marketing team at GitLab, and together with my colleague, Cesar, we're here to talk to you about GitOps. You can find me at several places around the web. Uh, while you're watching this talk, feel free to shoot me out a tweet on Twitter, and I'll be happy to respond with any questions or if you have any observations. Love to connect you with, with you on LinkedIn as well. So as you look at this, we all know the landscape of software development is changing. When we look back on, on how software development has evolved, we can remember the days of, of waterfall development. Maybe some of us in large enterprises are, are even still doing some of this where we're delivering software like it's hardware, but it causes a lot of challenges. Innovations like Agile and DevOps have allowed us to move a lot faster while also being a lot safer, deploying with less risk more frequently, uh, being able to easily roll back changes. And the latest evolution in cloud native applications is about dynamic environments. Those that scale up and down automatically based on load, uh, where things can shift and change, different users logged into the same application can have a completely different experience based on the region or what they've interacted with. And in order to manage all these complexity, we need an infrastructure automation practice that's able to keep up with all of it. And that's where GitOps comes in. In this talk today, we're gonna to tell you what GitOps is, why GitOps is important, and we'll give you a hands-on demo so you can see step-by-step -step how you can do GitOps yourself. To kick it off, what is DevOps? Well, uh, what is GitOps? So uh, GitOps is an operational framework that takes DevOps best practices, things we've used for application development for years, like version control, collaboration, compliance, and CICD, and it applies them to infrastructure automation. In a sense, GitOps is gonna have three major components. This is gonna be infrastructure as code, merge requests, or what we call MRs, and some types of Git platforms, they call them a PR, or pull request. At GitLab, we call it a merge request. And the MR, that's gonna be our, our agent of change. And automation. Uh, we're gonna use CICD, but essentially we wanna automate our changes. When you combine these together, you get the practice of GitOps. Let me step through briefly each of these. Infrastructure as code, merge requests as your agent of change, and CICD. Infrastructure's code has been around for a long time. And when I'm thinking about GitOps, I like to think not just about infrastructure's code, but sometimes I'll just say X's code, because this could be your infrastructure, configuration, this could be policy as code or security as code, any type of operations that you're doing at all, at all that you can define uh, in a text file, uh, in a text-based format, or define as code, all of a sudden it becomes very, very powerful. All of a sudden you can version it, you can uh, collaborate on it using uh, standard development collaboration tools like Git uh, that software development, uh, software developers have enjoyed, but now we can use it for operations. Uh, and so access code is a, is a powerful construct. And in particular, more and more and more, uh, we're not just having uh, procedural code, you can use that. You can do GitOps with procedural code, but more and more if we're using declarative tools, tools that allow us to just simply describe a desired state and our system is gonna enact that. Uh, these are tools like Kubernetes, um, a lot of modern infrastructures, code tools, Terraform and, and, and others allow you to work in a declarative fashion. And this is what really starts to, to unearth some power. Of course, as I mentioned, this is stored in, in Git version control. And so all of the Git tooling, uh, standard practice that engineers and developers are familiar with uh, using Git and all of your Git tooling, you get to leverage that with your operations when you're doing infrastructure as code. Um, but just having your infrastructure stored in a Git repo, that's not enough really to get the power of, of GitOps as a, as a collaboration. You need to be using the merge request as your agent of change. And the way this works is, is the merge request or the pull request serves as a gate for any changes that go out. So you would have a main branch that is tied to, let's say, an environment. This could be a 
we could call it the production branch, the main branch, the master branch, the trunk branch, uh, or it could be related to, let's say, a staging environment or any other type of uh, development or testing, whatever environment you have. But th that branch represents the state of that environment. And whenever you want to make changes to it, you create a new feature branch the same way an app dev team would for a software development feature. But in this case, it's a proposal for application changes. And that way you can collaborate on that branch. And when it gets merged back in to that main or that trunk branch, that enacts the change in that environment. What this allows you to do is through that merge request, you can do code review, collaboration, approvals, uh, manage all of your compliance. So a lot of powerful elements, these collaboration capabilities to be able to do code review, collaborate between developers, uh, security practitioners, operations engineers. Uh, that's what's really powerful about GitOps. And uh, certainly important is this automated reconciliation or CICD. We're going to use CICD as a, a type of reconciliation loop. You can imagine that anytime the state of the environment is out of sync with what we've defined as our declarative state and our Git repository, we want that to be matched up. So the CID, CICD can run. It can run every time, let's say, you, you merge to master. It can run on a timer. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to uh, tackle things like configuration drift. You know, unfortunately, when sometimes you uh, configure an environment and then all of a sudden, for whatever purpose, whether it's manual or there's errors and it, it drifts away from your configuration, the next time that CICD runs, the next time that automation loop runs, it goes and it gets the latest state, the source of truth from your Git repo, and it updates. Now, this can happen in uh, two different ways when you're using GitOps. There's two types of GitOps. This could be a, a uh, uh, agent-based GitOps, where you have an agent and that runs within your infrastructure. This is particularly popular when you use Kubernetes. Uh, you can have an agent running inside of the Kubernetes cluster, and that agent uh, continually pulls in configuration from uh, the Git repo. Or it could be a push based, where uh, you have that CICD running and it pushes into the cluster. And there are advantages and disadvantages of both. Uh, so the main core component here is that changes are implemented automatically, and we, we uh, are no longer making manual changes for infrastructure, but all of the state of the infrastructure stored in Git and all of those changes are applied by our automation tool, by our CICD. So that flow for GitOps flow, it ends up looking very similar to a software development flow. You would create an issue. We need to expand the number of nodes in our node pool, or uh, we need to lessen resources for a particular service because it doesn't get as much traffic and we want to save on cost. Uh, or we need to investigate because uh, something went down. Based on that uh, issue and defined uh, problem that we want to go tackle, you create a merge request with a branch, you run that automation, and then when it's merged back into master, you have your running, uh, running production environment. So some folks might ask, well, this sounds just a lot like infrastructure as code. What's the difference? Well, uh, with infrastructure as code, code may or may not be version controlled, right? You can take a YAML file or you can have a text-based definition in Linux. We've been using .com files for a long time. And uh, that .com file or that configuration file, that can live in you know, that can live on the server and you SSH to the server and you update that text file, you could call that infrastructure as code, but that's not GitOps. You're not, you're not storing that code in a Git repository. You're not using all the power of Git version control to do things like roll back, right? To, to roll forward. Um, this is particularly powerful. Let's say something goes wrong and uh, in the middle of a firefight, you just need to get that infrastructure up and going as soon as possible. But then later on, you want to do some introspection and, and you want to do some forensics and figure out what was it that went wrong. Well, if you just have the, the code stored in a text file somewhere, it's been updated and the state and the history has been lost. But if you're doing GitOps and it's stored in Git, you can actually see what the state of that infrastructure was before you made the changes. You could spin up another environment and do your forensics and introspection there. 
Same thing uh, with infrastructure as code, those changes may or may not go through any type of code review or approval process. But with GitOps, we use that merge request as the change agent. Um, this is so much faster and so much more automated than having your change management meeting, right? Uh, rather than having to sit around and discuss what goes in and what goes out and what's on the calendar, everything is just automated. You have your automated tests. A lot of times the security approvals can be automated. Um, so you can still have compliance, but it's super lightweight and it's automated when you're doing GitOps. And uh, finally, as, as I've kind of already said, you know, changes could be applied in many ways. If you're just doing infrastructure as code, you could SSH to the server. They may or may not be automated. But with, when we're doing GitOps, we're absolutely automating the infrastructure. So in a nutshell, you could say that GitOps is infrastructure as code done right. If you're doing it with the best practices, we're going to call that GitOps. So why is GitOps important? Well, you get a lot of benefits. Self-documenting environments. The code is there. You can now share knowledge amongst your teams. When somebody's clicking in a GUI, how do they tell other people what they did or how they did it? And as I mentioned, you want to duplicate that environment. Let's say uh, to spin up another thing or to, to do forensics after a firefight, as I mentioned before. You get these version control benefits, the ability to roll back and roll forward. Sometimes the app version depends on the infrastructure configuration and vice versa. Uh, let's say, for example, you have uh, a certain memory leak in the application. And so you have this application that takes a lot of, a lot of RAM and a lot of uh, compute power. And the developers, they go and they fix that. So now then with the new version of the application, we can have a, a more lightweight infrastructure running that same surface. It doesn't require as many resources. But uh, all of a sudden we found out that there was a bug in that new version of the code. So we actually had to roll back the application of the previous version that you know, didn't have this really terrible customer facing bug, but it didn't have the memory leak. It wasn't as efficient. Well, if you don't have the ability to roll back your infrastructure at the same time, and you deploy that new application where there's not enough resources, now you've taken down, you're gonna crash the whole environment. So this ability to version, uh, your infrastructure alongside of your application and, and have those walk along depending on the needs of each. It's really powerful, uh, helps with misconfigured, uh, misconfiguration of the infrastructure. And this can really, really help your mean time to recovery when things go down to, to having it in the version control. Uh, sometimes it just being able to quickly roll back to the last known uh, good config, last known good config, and we can roll back and we get up and going quickly. And then we can go back and try to figure out what's going on. We have these automation benefits. We can deploy faster, more often, with less risk. I've already talked a little bit about configuration drift, a key benefit of GitOps. And these security and compliance benefits, uh, especially with a lot of enterprises or a lot of businesses and organizations that are in regulated industries, you need to have a set of compliance policies that you follow. And this can mean permissions to your particular environment. This is compliance and collaboration. So you, get, you, you can have both. Sometimes you have only compliance where you can lock everything down and only a few people have access to the infrastructure tools and can update or make infrastructure changes and you're constrained by your compliance. But with GitOps, you're unleashed and you're compliant. Anybody can make a change, propose a change via an MR because it's just code, right? Anybody in the org, any developer, any engineer can propose an infrastructure change. But potentially, you could have just a few people that have the access to merge that change. And so that's how you can stay compliant and have collaboration. Uh, you can use all of the permissioning of, of Git. You get that um, for free, in effect. Uh, you, have, you have a change process compliance as well because you have an audit log of all your changes in your Git repo. Really, really powerful. So with that, we've talked about what GitOps is at a high level, why GitOps is important. At this point, I hope you are excited to see a hands-on demo, and I would like to pass it on to my colleague, Cesar. Thank you. 
Thank you, William. My name is Cesar Saavedra and I'm a technical marketing manager at GitLab. Here you can see my social handles. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, via any of them. So I'm going to be covering first a push-based uh, GitOps demo um, for the CICD component, which we've been calling agentless, and then later on we'll do the pull-based. In this scenario, uh, I'm going to be talking about these three uh, users. Uh, Sasha is a developer in this organization. Devon is a DevOps engineer, and Sydney is a database administrator. Sasha is going to be requesting a database uh, provisioning from Sydney, and Sydney is going to loop in Devon uh, into the whole collaboration effort. So here you see the GitOps uh, project is structured into two different sub projects. This is Sasha's view or console. There is a set of projects under the infrastructure uh, group and another set of projects under the application uh, application uh, directory. And this is a separation of duties uh, and concerns uh, within this project Then it optimizes the work and collaboration among the stakeholders that will be working towards a solution uh, within the MR. So let's go to Sasha's uh, uh, issue. Uh, I pre-created already one. Uh, it's about the, her needing the, to have a database provision that Sasha created it. He, she assigned it actually to uh, Sydney, the database administrator. Uh, and here are the details of the requirements of this request or the uh, details of the request. And notice also that uh, uh, this is uh, already in Sydney's uh, work list or uh, board of uh, to-do items. So let's go here to Sydney. <clears throat> and if she op uh, when she opens her boards, you'll see that the item is already in her to-do uh, board. So <clears throat> let's go into the issue itself. And then what Sydney is going to do here is she's going to read over the problem and she's going to start uh, she's going to start a merge request. Uh, other competing solutions call this uh, PR. And the mer merge request is where uh, all the collaboration is going to happen among the stakeholders. Uh, here she's going to loop uh, Devin. He's the DevOps engineer. Uh, just to make sure that uh, everything is going to be OK with the infrastructure uh, with respect to the Kubernetes environments that Devon uh, uh, oversees. Now she's going to open the web IDE and she's going to uh, navigate to a, a new file option and she's going to create uh, a new Terraform file for the instantiation of um, and the creation actually of this database. She, in this case uh, they are using uh, Terraform or she's using Terraform and she's going to paste here the, um, the Terraform file to create the MySQL database. Also, she uh, checks that uh, she's part of the code owners uh, file. And this basically says that anything under this project, AWS, she needs to approve. So she's going to commit the changes. And uh, with this, she's going to commit the changes to that uh, branch, newly created branch. This kicks off a pipeline with a merge review job and a plan stage, which is a stage where stakeholders will have a chance to review all the changes before they are rolled into production. So now let's switch to Sasha's uh, console and uh, she's going to refresh her page and notice that there's been some activity in the MR. So she's going to go into it. She's going to notice that there is a Terraform plan that has been run as part of the review uh, uh, step. So she's going to go ahead and expand that artifact and she's going to click on the view, uh, the full log. And here she checks the Terraform plan output and ensures that uh, everything is uh, good for the creation of the database, which is right there. She checks uh, all the parameters are correct and everything looks good. So now, uh, <clears throat> She's going back to the MR now. And now she's going to go into the changes. Now this shows uh, all the changes that have happened to the uh, infrastructure's code. In this case, it's uh, Terraform, but it could be uh, you know, CloudFormation and any other um, type of technology to do this. And then here she's uh, going to add a comment, an inline suggestion actually, for increasing the allocated storage 
from five uh, gigabytes uh, to 10. Again, this is, uh, this is showing how easy it is to collaborate within an MR. All right, so let's switch to Devon. Uh, this is Devon's uh, console. He's the DevOps, DevOps engineer that oversees the Kubernetes uh, clusters, among other things. And he's going to navigate to the AWS project. He's been looped into the uh, MR, remember, by Sydney. She's going to go into the MR. She's going to go into changes. This is something that concerns him. Um, and he's going to also participate in the collaboration. He's going to make a quick suggestion here about uh, the database uh, being to you know being uh, up to the latest uh, version of it. So he's making an inline suggestion again, like Sasha did. Also, he's going to make a uh, an inline comment here about the username. Uh, it should not be hard coded. It should be parameterized, and also a an inline comment about the password that it should not be there. It's insecure, and it should be really a mask variable within the project. So the last thing Devon's going to do is he's going to go back to the uh, MR and make a general comment uh, to Sydney about the EKS cluster needing to be scaled up uh, to two nodes to accommodate this uh, change in the Java microservice. So here, let's go back to uh, Sydney's uh, boards. Uh, oh, yeah, of course, uh, we forgot to uh, move the um, issue to the doing uh, board. Sydney's going back to the MR now. She's going to start reviewing all the unresolved threads that have been uh, applied to the MR from other stakeholders. So she's going to go ahead and apply the inline suggestion from Devon. Uh, and that's with a click, up, a click of a button. She does that. Same thing with... Um, the allocated storage uh, inline suggestion from Sasha. She's going to click on apply the suggestion. <clears throat> and that resolves the thread automatically. And then she's going to review Devon's uh, comment about the username, uh, parameterizing the username and uh, making a mask variable out of the password. Uh, so before she can resolve those two, comments, she's going to go ahead and go to the actual code and uh, open it in uh, the web IDE. And she's going to go ahead and make the changes uh, that uh, fulfill or resolve the uh, comments um, from Devon about the username and password. What she's going to do is she's going to parameterize both of them. And then she's going to go ahead and commit the changes to the branch. She's going to go back to the uh, MR and now uh, reply to Devon's comments about the username and password. as part of the collaboration that uh, the MR enables them to do. So the last thing she's uh, going to do is um, going to, now that the threads are resolved, she's going to go ahead and, uh, and add a comment asking Devon to create an issue uh, to increase the number of nodes in the EKS cluster uh, during the next next uh, sprint. So now, since um, Sydney is part of the code owners file, uh, she needs to approve the MR, which she does now. And code owners uh, outlines uh, the exact users and groups that uh, own certain files and paths in a repo, and it streamlines the merge request appro approval process. 
Now we're going back to uh, Sasha's uh, console and uh, the MR requires two approvers. So Sasha is going to approve the MR as well. And with this, now she can mark the MR as ready before she can merge it. Now notice there are some unresolved threads and uh, if you would like the merge to be uh, dependent on the, all the threads being resolved, you can set that up also in GitLab. But in this case, uh, I don't have that set that I don't have that uh, set up, so I can merge uh, with uh, unresolved threads. So now Sasha merges the MR, which is going to push. Basically, the changes uh, to production is, uh, you know, it's going to fire up a pipeline with stages that will uh, take that basically will apply all the infrastructure changes. In this case, the creation of a database, a MySQL database, uh, out to production. You can see the pipeline there has been launched. And this pipeline has, uh, you know, uh, many stages that will take, uh, you know, it will validate the configuration file plan and then apply it to production. So let's go to uh, <clears throat> the RDS service on Amazon and AWS, and uh, there's the databases uh, coming up there. Let's go into it and make sure that uh, the configuration matches what the um, what the MR basically merged into the repo. So the DB name is app DB. And uh, let's visit the configuration tab of the database. Uh, the engine version is the correct one per the uh, configuration in the repo. And also the storage is 10 gigabytes, uh, which was actually increased during the collaboration uh, among the stakeholders in the MR. So here is the uh, database is up and running and it's available now. All right, so let's go back to uh, Devon's uh, console. And uh, now Sydney had asked him to create a, an issue for to take care of the increase of the nodes uh, for the next uh, sprint uh, in, in uh, the nodes in EKS. So for brevity and for the sake of time, let's just make the change directly in the repo because uh, I have another demo to show you later. So this is the uh, the cluster itself on Amazon. As you can see under, it has only one node running. There's an instance ID. So let's go directly to the repo, the Git repo and update the minimum size of the cluster from one to two and let's commit the changes. All right, so we've committed to the main line or the master, and uh, that's going to fire up uh, another, it's gonna fire off another uh, pipeline here. You've seen that before, it's gonna do the validate plan, uh, the plan and the apply. And once it completes, you should see a second instance that have been deployed to the cluster and there you go now we have two nodes in the cluster up and running on aws so one more thing now we can change here is sydney uh, notices that the deletion protection is actually disabled so this database could be just deleted anytime if you have the right uh, privileges. So what she wants to do is as a database administrator, she wants to uh, turn this on so that uh, the database is not deleted uh, accidentally. So let's go back again for brevity uh, and for the sake of time, go directly to the configuration file in Terraform and make the uh, change to the appropriate field, which is that one, deletion protection. So let's edit the file. 
and change that uh, deletion protection from false to true. And then let's commit the changes. One more time, a pipeline is going to uh, be launched that will go through the steps of pushing this out to the running infrastructure. So let's go to the uh, to AWS uh, database console and you can see the deletion protection is disabled. So let's refresh. Um, well, let's wait, you know, once it, well, let's check if the pipeline is done. Now it's finished. And then uh, we can go back to, to AWS and let's do a refresh of the screen. Uh, to just uh, make sure that uh, the deletion protection has been enabled. And there you go. So the configuration has been successfully pushed out to, to the infrastructure. So using an MR for the agent of change, uh, push-based approach to CICD and infrastructure as code, we've been able to do GitOps in this first demo. One more thing I'd like to show you is uh, the title of this um, session is uh, multi-cloud applications. So, and right now we've been only using one cloud. So I just wanna show you that uh, these microservices run on other clouds as well. There's a few of them, there is actually three. So here you can see the clusters. We do have an EKS cluster, which uh, is what you've been seeing so far but we also have a GKE cluster that is also running for us. This is the configuration for the EKS cluster uh, that you can see through our integrations to uh, Kubernetes from GitLab. You can very quickly spin up and destroy clusters, EKS cl uh, Kubernetes cluster, sorry. And here you can see the GKE configuration called GitOps C Saavedra GKE. Now let's go uh, to the applications group and um, we have a Python application there, microservice. And um, let me show you, you know, how it's running on GKE, this is a second cloud. So if we go to the environments uh, dashboard, we can see that they, there are two environments running for that uh, microservice, uh, DAS default, which is the dynamic security application testing environment. This is just a simple microservice, this is hello from Python. And also there's a production environment that is also running on GKE. And it, it also says uh, hello from, from Python. So that uh, microservice is running on GKE. Uh, this other one called Spring MVC JPA is running on EKS. So if we go to the environments dashboard for it, you can see two environments. There's a staging environment and a production environment, and you can quickly access the uh, one um, in staging. And then through this live environment link, we can open the one in production. And this is actually a running uh, inventory, product inventory uh, microservice. And we can just add a, an entry there. And you can see that it's now safe to the database, the MySQL database that was provisioned earlier. So not only does uh, doing GitOps with GitLab fosters uh, collaboration, uh, but it also helps you with compliance and audit and with automated reconciliation of your infrastructure updates, which results in a higher fidelity uh, of your infrastructure in production. Although you can use uh, push-based CICD with GitOps, you also have the pull-based approach to CICD. And why is this needed? Uh, so many organizations, uh, you know, they cannot open their clusters to the internet. So uh, this approach of pool-based is good for them. Uh, here is a high level architecture of our uh, solution. Uh, we use an agent that is deployed to the cluster 
and there's a server side as well called CAS that is listening uh, on the server side. So the agent side connects to the server side Kubernetes agent and it waits for requests to process. Uh, uh, this is more detail about the agent server. It, what it does, it authenticates the agents uh, that are running on the cluster. It fetches configuration for the, uh, for the agents uh, and the corresponding repo. And then it keeps polling uh, for incoming uh, communication. The, uh, this is a, a high level relationship diagram of the uh, agent on the server uh, side uh, process. And this is a workflow of, uh, uh, you know, the whole process of the agent uh, checking uh, every uh, so many seconds with the server to see if there are any updates to the configuration of the project. We use the GitOps engine open source project for this implementation. And uh, the, you know, the Argo CD folks and the Argo Flux folks uh, came together and they are now collaborating in this new GitOps uh, engine project. So let's go over what uh, we call the pool-based uh, GitOps demo. And here I've already set up a GitLab instance on EKS. And uh, let's go and sign on to it. And this is the uh, password for the root uh, user of this GitLab instance. <clears throat> so let's log on as root. And we're gonna create two new projects. Uh, one of them, the first one's gonna be uh, what we call the GitOps project. And this is the project that is going to be observed by the um, Kubernetes agent server running on GitLab. And it's gonna be observed for changes in configurations of, infra of the infrastructure. In this GitOps project, we're going to create a file uh, called manifest. Uh, dot yaml and we're gonna it's gonna be empty to start with uh, and you'll you'll understand in a minute why it's empty and then we need to create a second project which is going to be called kubernetes agent and this is the configuration of the agent that will be running on the Kubernetes cluster. We also need to create a, a directory called uh, under .gitlab slash agents. And the third uh, directory there is, is the name of the actual agent that is gonna be running in the, in the Kubernetes cluster called, in this case it's called agent one. And in here, we're going to give it a config.yaml uh, with the configuration of that agent, which we can copy from the documentation. And this config configuration YAML actually is telling the agent what is the project to observe. And in this case, is the root uh, GitOps project that is going to be keeping track of. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to deploy, um, we actually, what's, what's, there's one more step. We need to configure the agent uh, in, uh, in, the GitLab, uh, in the GitLab cluster, in the Kubernetes cluster in this case. So we have to log on to the Rails console and the way we get there is through the runner. We gotta log into the runner pod and then enter the the Rails console, and then here we are entering, uh, creating a project, uh, the agent, and a token for it. And we're going to keep, uh, we're going to copy this top uh, token because we're going to need it when we configure that agent uh, in uh, in the cluster itself. So we're creating here uh, uh, the secret, Kubernetes secret for the agent that is running the uh, server on the server side. And this is the resources uh, YAML 
that uh, that basically describes the uh, configuration of the agent that will be deploying to the uh, to the Kubernetes cluster. The communication between the agent and the server side uh, is going to be using web sockets in this case. That happens to be the domain of the GitLab instance. And now we're going to go ahead and create the pod for the agent itself in Kubernetes. And then you can see the agent now is running in the cluster. And now we're going to go to the GitOps project. This is the project that is being observed for changes. And we're going to go ahead and edit it. And we're going to cut and paste something from the documentation. It's just uh, a manifest file that contains an N Nginx uh, deployment. And it's going to be deployed under, under the same uh, namespace of GitLab agent. And uh, that's Nginx right there. And there are two replicas. So once we save this and it's committed to the mainline, uh, the agent will detect that update. And then it'll communicate this uh, to the, the server side. So it's going to communicate this to the agent. Uh, the agent is actually polling. And as soon as it detects the configuration change, it will update the cluster. And as you can see here, you uh, the uh, agent has already deployed the uh, the two instances of nginx and now um, so that you can see how modifications can be immediately detected by the agent we're going to increase the replicas to three the agent is going to detect this change and is going to go ahead and act upon it and instantiate another pod with a third nginx uh, which is right there actually right there now we have three so this is uh, a quick demo of the kubernetes agent gitlab kubernetes agent um, and here is the clusters uh, running on gke and uh, if we review the dashboards we can review the dashboard of the uh, server side first, which is called CAS, Kubernetes Agent Server. And if we go into the logs, uh, you can see the different, um, the different events that took place. First is listening on five, uh, port 5005, uh, members web sockets that uh, the uh, server agent and the agent itself are talking on and here it's detecting the agents the kubernetes agent server is actually uh, detecting modifications to the GitOps project that is the one being modified it's also checking the identity of the agent running on the cluster itself and this is the agent log that is talking to the CAS which is running on the server side and this is this is the agent running on the Kubernetes itself a cluster itself uh, this is in the case you know where organizations cannot uh, make their clusters available on the internet this agent is the one running on that cluster uh, talking to this to, to the CAS to the Kubernetes agent server running on GitLab, the CAS is authenticating it and then informing the agent of any updates that have to taken place on the on the GitLab side. And then the agent is uh, getting those updates and applying them to, to the cluster on which it's running. 
And here's the log, uh, the different log events for the agent itself that is running on uh, the Kubernetes uh, cluster. So again, uh, you know, this is a demo of the pool-based uh, CI/CD uh, used uh, in GitOps, and um, you know, you can use uh, push-based and pull-based, these two are not, uh, you know, they are not ex uh, exclusive of each other. They're actually complementary. So you can use them. You can use a push-based approach with pull-based approach together in combination. And, uh, you know, it just depends on what your needs are and different customers have different needs and, uh, and GitLab has you covered in either case. So that's all we have. Thank you so much. And until next time.